I want to take you back to a time in my life where I had a really bad day. I'm sure all of you have had bad days or difficult times in your life. Mike even mentioned as an entrepreneur, we face struggles, we face challenges. And sometimes we're really not quite sure how to navigate those challenges or those struggles and come out on top, or maybe not on top, but come out with a more positive outlook on life, a more positive mindset. So I want you to think back to a day or a time, or maybe it's just now, where you feel a little overwhelmed, or you feel like you just can't take the next step. For me, one of the days that comes to mind for me is September 4th of 2008. I'm a mom of eight children. Two of my beautiful daughters are here with me today. I love having that many children. It's just organized chaos more or less in my home. If you have children, you know how that is. Just multiply it by the number that you have to get to eight. <laughs> um, and it's that much more chaotic. But this was a day that my, um, my husband gave me a phone call. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. He had left for work and he called me and he said, Linda, something's happened to Garrett. You need to go to the Bowman's house right away. Now Bowman's house, was uh, Garrett's best friend, Brian Bowman, and they spent a lot of time together. Garrett was 20 years old. He was a personal trainer, he was big in fitness, he was a fitness competitor, but I didn't know what had happened to him. And it, uh, immediately, as a parent, you know, this, this big knot got, came into my stomach. And so I jumped in my Sequoia, and I started driving down Durango as fast as I could to get to Bowman's house. On the way, I was madly dialing Bowman's mom, mom and his dad. Nobody was answering, nobody was picking up my call, and I was terrified. Finally, I got through to Greg Bowman, Brian Bowman's dad. And I said, Greg, what's going on? What's going on with Garrett, is he okay? And he was silent for a minute. I said, Greg, I need to know what's going on. And he said, Linda, I'm sorry but Garrett has passed away. My heart sunk. And I knew at that point in time, I was driving on the road to go see my past son. He died of an oxy Oxycontin overdose, an accidental Oxycontin overdose. And that was tragic, it was very unexpected. He was an amazing kid. But that was something that really negatively impacted me personally and impacted the rest of my family. For years, I struggled to deal with that. I think once you lose a child, it's not anything you ever get used to or overcome. You just start to live to learn, you start to learn to live with that loss and that pain. And it took me a number of years to do that. I was at the point where I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't want to function. I didn't really want to eat. I just wanted to disappear because my grief was so overwhelming. Shortly after Garrett's death, um, I, one of my daughters has, uh, has bipolar illness, and shortly after his death, she started having these ups and down cycles to the point where we had to put her in the hospital, into a state mental hospital. That was really challenging and struggling, a struggle for us as well. That here again was the time where it just breaks your parents' heart to see your child go through these challenges and struggles. So as the years went on and we were struggling with recovering or trying to deal with Garrett's death and trying to help Amber be healthy and well. In the midst of this, we had a home building business in Las Vegas. Now, those of you that are familiar with home building, you know that starting in 2008, it started the great home building crisis. And Las Vegas was ground zero. We had a family run home building business for 25 years that had been very successful. And we struggled to stay afloat, but during this time, we kept losing ground and losing ground and losing ground, not to necessarily anything that we had done, but to, due to the economy. And so here was a, a myriad of one blow after another after another. I found myself just curled in a ball, not wanting to get out of the corner. I didn't know how to go on or how to have the hope that things might be better. About this time, my brother, Dr. B.J. Fogg from Stanford University had created the Tiny Habits Method. And I started working with him in that method. And as I started to work with him, one day as I was on the phone with him, and he's very, we're very, very close. He knew that I was struggling. I was struggling emotionally, mentally, financially, any leeway that you can think I was struggling. <laughs> um, 
So as I was talking to BJ, he said, hey, Linda, why don't you try this tiny habit and see if it helps you? We now call this habit the Maui habit. But at this point in time, it did not have a name. And the habit goes like this. After my feet hit the floor in the morning, I will say it's going to be a great day. And then I'll celebrate. Well, BJ's a pretty smart guy. And I thought, well, why not? I'll try this. It's not going to hurt. And so as I started practicing that tiny habit recipe, what surprised me was if in three days, it helped me have a better mindset. By every morning, when my feet hit the floor, and I say it's going to be a great day, and then I celebrate it, I attach a positive emotion to that, that statement, my day goes better. How does that happen? What happened is by practicing that habit, it moved me out of a victim mindset into a victor mindset. Huge mindset shift for me. It gave me the power to control my day instead of allowing my day to control me. Small shift, but huge results. And this is how I can stand, stand up in front of you and tell you not only does, do these small changes lead to big results, small changes change everything. But for me, this tiny habit saved my life. It gave me back the hope. It gave me back the power that I could really design how I'm going to show up in life. The tiny habits method has also given birth to what we call the pearl habits method. Same methodology, only with pearl habits, you use those anchor moments or use tiny habit recipes in situations where you're struggling, where you're having a hard time coping or navigating, or when, when things just little, even little irritants surface. And so the method that you're going to learn today can be applied just to create regular habits. And we're, the next three days, we're going to be learning a lot of information. We're going to learn a lot of things that we want to start doing in our businesses. And by applying the tiny habits method to these things, it will give you a way to actually create habits that work and that are sustainable. Also, by looking at the Pearl Habits Method, it will give you a technique that will allow you to create positivity, to create beauty out of difficult situations, beauty out of those irritants that sometimes you feel are going to take you down. How can you turn those and become more powerful and strong as a result of those irritants? So that's what we'll be talking about. Um, all right. So as I mentioned, Tiny Habits is a scientifically proven method developed by Dr. B.J. Fogg from Stanford. Um, I have the privilege of having him as a brother. He's been one of the biggest influences in my life. I think God knew what he was doing when he made B.J. my brother, because I don't know if I would have been able to navigate some of the challenges I've shared with you. Um, so you do have a handout in front of you. And so this is going to be a participatory type of an event for you. So grab this out. And what I want you to do right now is I want you to think about a habit that you would like to create. If you had a magic wand and you could create any habit for yourself, what habit would you wish for? I'm going to give you 30 seconds to write that habit down right up here, that very first, under that first question. What habit would you like to create? It could be a work-related habit, a business building habit. It could be a personal habit. All right, I'm gonna ask my trusty scribe and daughter, Brittany, to come up and write some of these for us. Okay, let's share some of these. Uh, who has a habit? That, Matt, I can tell you, I'm gonna pick on you right now. <laughs> for me, it's uh, healthy eating choices. Uh, like, sugar is my uh, trip the night, so like, I wanna eat healthier, be more healthy when it comes to eating. Better choices. Great, all right, eating he healthy eating. Healthy eating, eating healthier, either way, how you want to say that. All right, let's take another one. Yes, back here, Yuli. Exercise regularly. Okay, great, love that. All right, let's take about three more. Yes, right here. And I'm sorry, if I point to you, I'm sorry, please share your name with me. I'm getting to know all of you. Ellen. Ellen. Okay, stay in the slow zone. Great, I love that. Yes. Early riser. All right. I love that. Teresa, let's go back here and then we'll go over here. Teresa. I practice yoga. Okay. Awesome. All right. Be able to focus for 50 minutes. Be in focus for 50? 15. 15. 15. Okay, great. All right. Well, let's go over to here this room. Yes, Marissa. Uh, 
Daily Daily prayer habit. All right. Great. All right. This is a good list. Now your habit may or may not be on here and that's okay. We're going to come back to these as we walk through the tiny habits method and all of you will have an opportunity to design a tiny habit recipe to help you achieve your magic wand wish. Does that sound good? Are you okay with that? All right. Thanks, Brett. Okay. All right, so let's get into some of the fundamentals of how human behavior works. We're going to lay the, the foundations to understanding human behavior, and then we will go into the tiny habits method itself. But I think it's important for you to really understand human behavior. And learning this model will probably help you see the world differently and help you design for the outcomes that you want for yourself, your family members, your spouse, your children, and even your staff. So this is called the fog behavior model. And here again on your sheet, you do have a place to write this down. I'm going to encourage you to follow along with me. Here again, this is a model that BJ designed about 30 years ago, and it has become an industry standard in understanding how behavior works in, behavior de in the behavior design world. So when we're talking about the FOG behavior model, what this model tells us is behavior happens when motivation, ability, and a prompt come together at the same time. Okay, this is important. Oftentimes, and even some of my contemporaries in the health and wellness industry think that it's only about motivation. And sometimes we're misled that, oh, I'm not, it's not motivated enough. That's why I'm not doing that. Guess what? That's not true. So don't guilt yourself because it's not all about motivation. A prompt, which is a call to action, needs to occur when somebody has the ability to do that behavior that they already want to do. All right, so as we look at this model, on this dimension, right here we have motivation. And motivation ranges from high to low. On the bottom dimension here, we have ability. And ability also ranges from high to low. So if something has high ability, what we call it is easy to do. So if your ability is high, that behavior is easy to do. So on the right-hand side here, we put easy to do. If your ability is low, that means a behavior is hard to do. Okay, let's, let's apply this model. Imagine that you're sitting here. Well, let's, let's take the first scenario. Imagine that you're at home. And you might be watching a football game or doing something fun and you have your phone with you and imagine that your phone rings the ringing of the phone is a call to action it's a prompt to answer the phone now if you're in you know relaxing at home you have the ability most likely to answer the phone so the prompt occurs but the ring of the phone you have the ability to answer the phone and if you glance at your phone and it says a friend or a loved one that's calling then you have the motivation to answer the phone so when that prompt occurs that behavior happens, okay? So we have high motivation and it's easy to do. All right, let's take a, an opposite behavior. We're sitting here in this room together. We're involved in learning and connecting and building relationships. You probably have your phone by you. I see many of you do. If you're like me, my phone is silenced as Mike asked us to silence our phone. But you probably still have a vibration when your phone calls coming in or some kind of prompt. So when that prompt is received and you're sitting in an environment like this, you don't really have the ability to answer the phone unless you get up and walk out. Also, you might glance down at your phone and might say unknown caller. Well, you're probably not motivated to answer that call. So down here, with low motivation and low ability, that behavior does not happen. So what we see here is motivation and ability are a trade-off. With the right amount of motivation and ability, when it falls below, above this, what we call the action line, that behavior will happen. It's a given. It's not a might or maybe it will happen. Okay? Questions about this? What questions do you have? All right. Let's talk about, before we move on, um, let's talk about how this might work in your everyday life. Say you have a team member that you want to do a certain behavior. What, how do you get them to do that behavior? 
you give them the prompt or the call to action when they have the ability to do that behavior. And of course, hopefully they're motivated to be paid or motivated to help you stay on track. So that behavior will happen. Another example, um, I'll use this, I've used this example in the past and I think it will help you as well. Imagine, now from like in my case, imagine that I wanted to have my husband take out the garbage. That's the behavior I wanted to design for. And if I'm coming home with him from a ball game or a grocery store or something like that, and I said, hey Brent, when we get home, will you take out the garbage? Is that behavior gonna happen? No. Probably not. Okay, why? Because the prompt was not delivered at the time the behavior could be done. No, because he's male. <laughs> no, because he's male, I love that. Okay, I love that. Um, so a better way to deliver that prompt would be maybe we're at home and he's not really occupied doing something and the prompt would be, hey Brent, can you take out the garbage? Well, he has the ability to do that, even though he is male, he has the ability to do that. And of course he's motivated to keep me happy, I'm hoping. And so that behavior would happen. Okay, are you seeing how this fits in your everyday life? Yeah. So start looking at things differently. Start applying the FOG behavior model to design for the behaviors that you want from yourself and from others. All right, well now let's move on to the tiny habits method and how this applies to the FOG behavior model. And here's a prettier picture of the FOG behavior model. So and you're welcome to take a picture of that or my email is on the bottom of the sheet. You're welcome to email me and I'll send you these slides or I'll send you some of these models that we're using, the graphics, okay? All right, let's get into the tiny habits method. Um, tiny habits gives pe people hope and evidence that they can change. We have coached over, wow, we're now probably more than 120,000 people worldwide in our five-day tiny habits program. It's a free program we run every week. We have, every week we do studies and we do research on the results of the people that go through the five-day tiny habits program. I know many of you in this room are coaches. Here's a takeaway that will help you in your coaching business. People change best when they feel good, not when they feel bad. Okay, let me say that again. People change best when they feel good, not when they feel bad. I was trained as a personal trainer and this has put all my training on its head. Because as a personal trainer, it's like, you can do more, you're not doing enough, come on. You know, you know. That's the wrong way to help your clients change. Okay? Help them feel good about what they're doing. Help them feel successful. Help them gain back that hope. And these little tiny steps, these little tiny behaviors are what will help them give, create breakthroughs for themselves. So maxim number one, there are two maxims with the tiny habits method. Maxim number one is help people do what they already want to do. Motivation is slippery and it is fickle. So don't focus on motivation. Help yourself do what you already want to do. Maximum number two is help yourself feel successful. This comes down into really tapping into your emotions. So we will be learning some skills that you can apply immediately today in the rest of what we're learning today and tomorrow and on Friday. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of a tiny habit. The first part of the anatomy of a tiny habit is an anchor moment. It is an existing routine that acts as a prompt. We all have existing routines in our life. Like we get up in the morning, our feet hit the floor. In fact, on your desk, you have some tiny habit recipe cards. These are yours, obviously, to take home. I always encourage my clients to do the mountain habit. It's on blue. This has changed my life. It's changed thousands of people's lives by starting their day off with a positive mindset. What we think impacts how we perform. So this is a habit that I highly recommend that you implement as a tiny habit recipe. Um, so when you think about designing a habit, think about your existing routines. That existing routine, just like in the FOG behavior model, is gonna act as our prompt, okay? One of what we call our classic tiny habit recipes is after I flush the toilet, I will do two push-ups. Why? Because that's an existing routine that's reliable. So attach a new behavior that you're wanting to create as a habit to that existing routine and then that will prompt it, okay? The second part of the anatomy of a tiny habit is making a behavior really, really tiny. So it's so easy to do that it's basically there's no resistance, it's not difficult, that you can start planting that little tiny seed to take root and then expand and grow to be bigger. And the third part of the tiny habit, and we'll come back to making a behavior tiny enough in a minute, but the third part is what we call an instant celebration. What we mean by an instant celebration is emotions create habits. In fact, write that down. 
emotions create habits. If this is the only concept you really remember and apply from our 30 minutes together today, you will be able to create breakthroughs. Breakthroughs when you're struggling, breakthroughs when you're not struggling. This is the, 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 the secret ingredient. This is also the part that most people that copy BJ's method miss completely. So you know more than... All right, so, um, and under the anatomy, you can write A, B, C. That's where, how we identify the anatomy. A is for anchor moment, B is for tiny behavior, and C is for an instant celebration, okay? Now on your table, all of you have cards that look like this, okay? I'm only gonna give you 60 seconds, but as a table, I want you to come up with a celebration that you're assigned on this card. All right, so you're gonna have to work together for 60 seconds. And at the end of 60 seconds, we'll have some of you share them, all right? Okay, ready, go. All right, good job. All right, let's start with going through some of these ways that you can celebrate your tiny habit recipes. And what these are is there's ways to pull up a positive emotion. You're tapping into your endorphins and, your, and the dopamine system in your body. Then you're taking that emotion and attaching it to a tiny behavior. So as you're trying to develop a habit, the prompt prompts that tiny behavior and the celebration reinforces that tiny behavior. The stronger the emotion is, the faster that behavior will become an automatic behavior and the faster that behavior will grow to be the desired size. All right, so everybody ha that has number one, stand up. There, should, there are a couple tables with number one. All right. Okay, number one. Okay, we're gonna start over here. Do a physical movement once. Go. All right. Good job. All right. <laughs> Good. All right. Give him a hand. Good. All right. This is our All right. Go. Physical movement once. Woo! All right. Good job. Good job. All right. Tables that have number two, stand up. Do a physical movement that flows. We only have one table number two. Is there another two over here? All right, you guys are it. Ready, go. All right. <laughs> Good job. All right, number three, say a word or a phrase out loud. Stand up our threes. All right, we'll start over here at this side of the room. Ready, go. Let's do this. All right, good. Good job. All right, let's go to this group. All right, good. <laughs> All right, good job. All right, number five, sing a song phrase out loud. All right. <laughs> we'll go with our front table first. Ready, go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear me. <laughs> awesome, good job. Good job. All right, we'll go back to this table. Oh. Woo! All right, awesome. All right, and the last one, vocalize music or sound effect out loud, number seven. All right, we'll start with this group and then we'll go over here. All right, ready, go. Very good, very good. All right. All right. And then back to back here, last group. All right, good job. So how are you feeling right now? Amazing, energized, how, excited, joyful, happy. All right, so these are the types of celebrations that you can use to reinforce your tiny habit recipes. Reinforce those behaviors because it helps lock them in. It pulls up these feelings of happiness, excitement, and helps you feel energized. And if you feel awkward and weird, that's okay. It's a new skill. And so as you learn new skills, you will go through that growth phase. All right, let's go back real quickly to some of our aspirations that you wrote down, your magic wand wishes that you wrote down at the top of your sheet. I would like a volunteer that I can quickly coach through how to design a tiny habit recipe. Off yes, go ahead. Come on up. Yep. And tell me your name again, I'm sorry. I'm Ellen. Ellen. I'm a GI. Okay, so Ellen, what was, <laughs> what was your magic wand wish? Uh, stay in the flow zone. Okay, what does that mean to you? 
that means I'm starting a new business and so that means I just have to stay in this positive flow that I, if I change me, then the business will come. That, okay. That I'm the thing that changes that allows the conditions and the situations to change around. Okay. So as I'm coaching Ellen, notice the questions I'm asking, and they're called crispification questions. And the questions basically are who is doing what, when, where, with whom, and what tool is being used. And I know I'm going through that pretty quickly, but you can um, corner me later on and I'll go back through those. So, so Ellen, as we're talking about this, what does that look, I mean, I know we talked about what does it look like to be in flow state, but what do you do to get into flow state? I'm learning because I'm in this class right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it really, it's just stopping the negative chatter in my brain. Is, okay. So that's not maybe what I'm doing. What I'm okay. doing is um, staying in the positive space of abundance and being fully resourced and knowing that I can do this. Okay, so what I hear you saying is you really want to control your thoughts. You really want to stay more positive on your thoughts. Yes. Okay, yes. so uh, the anchor moment, and I'm jumping you guys way ahead on this, but the anchor moment would be when I have a negative thought. Would, would that, does that sound right? Yes. Okay, so that would be the anchor moment that Ellen would use. So when I have a negative thought, I will. What, what do you want to do when you have a negative thought to diffuse that? It's not only a thought though. Sometimes I get the knot in my stomach first, but yes. Um, so uh, what do I want to do? I want to remind myself that I'm fully resourced and that I have this amazing group of people that I know amongst okay. other masterminds that I'm in and I can, I can do this. Okay. Let's get really specific. I love that. I love that. Let's get really specific. So when I have a negative thought, I will remind myself that I'm fully resourced. Okay. I'm fully resourced and then celebrate that. Say, yes, I am. Good job. Does that seem like that would help you? Yes. All right. Good, thank you. Okay. Woohoo, high five, we're gonna do a high five. So do you see how simply and easily that is when you take these components and you get really specific as to what is that prompt? What is that anchor moment? In fact, Dr. Daniel Amen is one of my clients and I love the fact that you went there because one of the habits that we designed for his Brain Fit Life program is when I have a negative thought, I will ask myself if it is true. Yeah, and then celebrate. And he states, just by questioning that thought, it helps you realize that that's not an accurate thought or that's unreasonable, so you can push it away. So thank you for being able to participate and thank you for being willing to be vulnerable. So during the breaks today, one of the breaks, I want you to just take a couple of minutes and design a tiny habit recipe based off your magic wand wish. And if you want some help from me or from Brittany, who's also one of our tiny habit certified coaches, corner us, we'll help you. We want you to leave here today with a tiny habit recipe or more that will help you achieve what you want to achieve, will help you achieve your magic wand wish. But you need to break that behavior down to so tiny, it does not take any willpower to do and design a prompt for that to happen. Another card that is here is design a tiny habit re recipe to reduce stress. Who couldn't use this? Oh, yeah. So through the next three days, start thinking about these. And if you want some help, let us know. I want to share again a little bit more as I close here, how impactful this method has been in my life. Now, what I didn't tell you when I shared my Maui habit and how that has saved my life is shortly after um, we got into the, all the challenge with home building business and whatnot, we actually lost our home building business. We could not survive ground zero. We had to lay off my son, my son-in-law, my brother. It was a family run, run business and that was so difficult. Not only that, we could not recover. We had to file chapter seven bankruptcy. And in the midst of that, my husband was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Well, the tiny habits method has really helped me be resilient and help me show up every day ready to face the day as my best self. And I know it can do that for you as well. <sighs> Two years ago, we did lose my husband to early onset Alzheimer's. That came much more quickly than we expected. And as those days came to have a viewing and a funeral in the midst of COVID, we were still allowed to do that, social distanced. I didn't know how I was gonna get through that week or those two days. And I knew darn well that getting up and saying it's gonna be a great day was just gonna be an absolute lie. I, I couldn't, you know, I'm so literal. It's like, no, I can't do that. That's not gonna be accurate. And so I revised that habit. So those two days, instead of when my feet hit the floor in the morning, saying it was gonna be a great day, what I said instead is I'm gonna make it a great day for those that come to pay their respects to Brent. 
I put my focus on the people that came out of their way to see my family, to see me, and to see my husband. As a result, those days were great days. I know you can do this too. Make every day of your life a great day.